You're listening to the November 20th, 2015 edition of the Cybercrime and Business Podcast, the weekly podcast that's focused exclusively on how the world of cybercrime is impacting business. This week's guest is Mark Gazit. He's the CEO of Israel-based ThetaRay. Last week, prosecutors unveiled a 23-count indictment with alleged crimes targeting 12 organizations, including nine financial service companies and media outlets, such as the Wall Street Journal. The lead prosecutor in the case said that the data breaches at these firms were, quote, breathtaking in scope and size, and that they signal a brave new world of hacking for profit. And we chat about that wide-reaching scheme and what it means for the future of cybercrime. This podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. I'm Jeff Peters, Surfwatch Labs editor, and I'm here with Matt Leifus, Surfwatch Labs writer. Coming up in a little bit, we'll have that interview with Mark Gazit, as well as some discussion around ISIS, new point-of-sale breaches, and the latest cyber advisories and legal developments. But first, we're going to recap the top trending cybercrime events, as always, from the past week. Coming in number three this week, we have Chipotle. You guys know Chipotle. I like to look at it as like the factory way of making burritos, but they're delicious. I'm not, I'm not knocking them down. Due to some misguided practices from Chipotle's HR department, anyone could have read emails meant for the HR department. This issue exists because Chipotle's HR department is replying to job applicants using the domain chipotlehr.com, which is a domain that is not owned or controlled by the company. So what this means is anyone that was willing to register that domain, the chipotlehr.com, It would have gave them access to all the emails being sent back and forth from Chipotle's HR department and these job applicants, so potentially putting all of these emails at risk. I believe that's actually what happened as a security researcher. He was applying for a job at Chipotle, and he ended up discovering this. The security researcher was unemployed, so he was applying for jobs. But anyways, yeah, he looked into it, and he ended up discovering this issue, which uh, which has now been fixed. I think Chipotle is not using that domain anymore. Coming in at number two, we have Nutmeg, not the spice. Um, A system glitch allowed customers of Nutmeg, which is an investment management firm, access to some of the company's clients. Uh, The glitch, according to Nutmeg, was a fault in the code that was running its email service. In total, 32 people were victimized by the glitch. The information compromised included names, addresses, and investment details. The glitch has since been fixed. Coming in at number one, and we're actually going to discuss this in a little bit, we have ISIS, Anonymous, and Op Paris. Anonymous, as a lot of people probably are aware, uh, declared cyber war on ISIS after the brutal terrorist attack in Paris. To date, Anonymous has already taken down about 5,500 Twitter accounts linked to members of ISIS. Uh, Anonymous is asking their members to avoid DDoS attacks at this time and focus their efforts on data exfiltration. Those are the top trending industry targets for the week. And, you know, taking a look at this anonymous ISIS situation, you know, like I said, they they declared war on ISIS. And we we see this a lot with anonymous with their campaigns. They take up a cause and they do certain things. Jeff, from what we were saying, you you have a little bit more like more current information on this. Yeah, well, it's always hard to keep track with anonymous because it's such a big group. And I really don't care enough about them to like you know, all the different little factions within it. But there was one video I saw in a CBS News article, one video from one uh, faction of Anonymous that claimed that they'd taken down more than 20,000 accounts. And this video was posted on Wednesday. So I've been hearing different things. Yeah, and I think, I think another thing that's important to point out, now we're, you know, we're seeing this Operation Op Paris, and you'll see that, you know, the hashtag Op Paris and uh, various other ones. But Anonymous has already been targeting ISIS for quite some time. Actually, as a matter of fact, they already have uh, campaigns against ISIS that have been going on for a couple months. So they have it. They have been targeting them for uh, quite some time. Yeah, I think there was even some operations going back to, uh, I think, January, the beginning of the year. And then I think the Op ISIS started, I think, in June or sometime over the summer. So the media is making a big deal about this and talking about it. But yeah, really, this has been going on for a while. I was reading one article on Motherboard and they quoted uh, J.M. Berger. He's a well-known terrorism expert and co-author of, the, of a book on ISIS. He did a study in March, and he revealed that ISIS is using at least 46,000 Twitter accounts over, the, over a span of three months. 
And according to him, at least, the number of Twitter accounts isn't growing. It's kind of staying level. So, you know, that's one good thing. I don't know if you can attribute any of that to Anonymous or if that has anything to do with it. But possibly it's, you know, could be one benefit from Anonymous doing this. So when we're talking about this now, Jeff, I don't know about you. I, I have a lot of friends in social media, you know, and obviously when we're going through looking at our data, checking out the web, you see a lot of people that anytime an honest does something, they're, they're really for it. Like, oh, yeah, you know, stick it to the man, whatever. And when you actually really think about it and you get into what it is that they're doing, I mean, are, first of all, the question always comes to my mind. I mean, are they actually doing anything that is worthwhile? And then is there any potential backlash from their actions? Yeah, well, it's interesting, the official position of the site, you know, this app ISIS site that I was looking at, you know, they said that they don't want the the people doing DDoS attacks and other thing. They want to just gather intel. But I did also see on Twitter, there's at least some parts of Anonymous that are preparing this big DDoS attack on December 4th and everyone's tweeting about it and promoting it. And I just remember when I first started covering cybersecurity, you know, I asked some DDoS experts about that, about, you know, hacktivists always promoting it. And they basically said, it makes perfect sense to me. Obviously, if they're out there promoting it, it's because they really can't do anything because otherwise they would just do it and that would make the news. But it's like they can't really cause any damage, so they just puff up their chest and do all this publicity. So, yeah, that's that's sort of one side of it. And there's been a little bit of hacktivist drama, which I really I really hate and try to stay out of. But <laughs> <laughs> well, That's better That's better than uh, what they got, baby mama drama. I mean, yeah, a little bit better than I, that. I'd rather have some uh, hacktivist drama. But I'm it's like, you know, if you go on Twitter, you can see all these hacktivists arguing with each other. And there, I've, you know, read some news stories where, you know, some people are saying that, I think one guy said, you know, it's just about stroking the ego of Anonymous. You know, we already have Op ISIS and now you're doing Op Paris and just trying to, you know, get all this media attention. So there's a lot of that going on. And, and one interesting thing that I saw is there's this other group called Ghost Security Group. They actually were formerly affiliated with Anonymous and they, they like put out a press release and kind of rebranded, and um, I think they used to just be Ghost Security, but now they're Ghost Security Group. And they they said that they restructured to quote improve the group's capabilities to deliver support to the counterterrorism community. And I think they want to be a little more professional, I guess, than anonymous. If that's that's kind of at least the takeaway that I took from it. So they're kind of another group that's targeting ISIS, and. Its members are kind of, they're kind of claiming to do the similar things such as take down jihadist websites, social media accounts, YouTube videos, all that. But the group also claims to be doing a little more of this intel gathering that some of these anonymous people are claiming they want to do. According to this motherboard article I was reading, it said that the group claims to be passing intelligence on ISIS members and operations to the U.S. government. And according to Digital Shadow, who is one member of this group, he says that the information has actually helped to stop attacks. Motherboard couldn't verify if that was true, but there is this guy, Michael Smith, who is the head of a U.S. defense consultancy firm, and he's been acting as the liaison between this group and the U.S. government, and he basically said that, that it is true that they actually have disrupted some ISIS operations. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting you get all these different hacktivist things going on, and a lot of people are arguing this week about whether any of it's good or what the use of it is, but it sounds like at least there's maybe some good that's coming out of this. Although, you know, I, I hate to pick sides, really, you know, because I generally don't not a big fan of most hacktivists. So it's easy to, like, agree with the hacktivists when they're doing something you like, but then when they're doing something you don't like, it's... Uh... No, I, yeah, and I, I hear you. And, and when I first started working here, you know, I used to... I was on the bandwagon with a lot of my friends, and anytime you'd hear of like anonymous operation, you're like, "Oh yeah, you know, great, they're they're really sticking up for people." But should something happen to ISIS, I mean, of course, I wish, but it's more like chest beating and hear me roar and you know, look at us, and it's much flashy. This other group that you're talking about, I've never even heard of, and they're they're accomplishing a lot more. And when you say accomplish, it, it's a loose term because you still don't know what's actually being accomplished. But they're they're doing something and they're doing more of it, and it seems like they're doing it a little better. Yeah, and one thing I was wanting to read in all this, obviously on the podcast, you try to focus around cybercrime and business. So I was really thinking, you know, well, does any of this really mean anything for businesses out there? And I guess there's a couple things that kind of popped up in the news kind of around all this anonymous ISIS stuff. The first thing is there's this whole encryption debate everyone's been that's kind of been an ongoing thing. This just kind of brings it to the surface again. 
I saw one interesting story on NBC News. They reported that ISIS actually has a 24-hour help desk, and this help desk advises basically different members of ISIS on how to encrypt their communications in order to evade authorities. So, of course, all the people, like FBI Director James Comey, he was speaking at a conference this Wednesday, and he said basically that the, the agency does track ISIS over Twitter and they track their recruitment, but that once they get someone who's basically willing to die for the cause, that they tend to move their communications over to encrypted platforms. So a lot of the government agencies, obviously, they want access to all this and just kind of brought up the whole privacy stuff again. But it'd be interesting, you know, that could have some consequences. And anytime a, a, a tragedy like this happens, there's potential laws and stuff get passed and could affect different companies. Yeah, and talking about uh, uh, governments worrying, uh, the U.K. government is worried that Islamic State hackers will target the country's critical national infrastructure, including hospitals, airlines, and even nuclear power stations, and announced on Tuesday an investment in cybersecurity of 1.9 billion euros over the next five years to combat their efforts. Yeah, I, I saw that, that news story and uh, got a few headlines this week, and I think Really nothing's changed. We've talked about this a lot on the podcast. I think even going back to Mark Gazit, he's our guest today on this podcast, but he was one of our first guests a year ago, and he talked a lot about, uh, in that interview from a year ago, um, he talked about these groups and other nation states kind of building up these capabilities. And Chancellor George Osborne from the UK, he said that about ISIS, they don't really have the capability yet to, you know, disrupt hospitals, airlines, and nuclear power stations, but the concern is that they want it, and they're doing their best to build that infrastructure, and if they have enough money, they can just purchase it. And that's something we've heard from people again and again and again. So, you know, it's not nothing necessarily new, but it's just interesting that it's it's popped up so much recently. Yeah, and, and like Jeff said, well, you know, we, we have talked, we've talked, I think even very recently, we were talking about the United States critical infrastructure, and people were discussing, you know, ISIS's ability to do any type of damage. And it, it's kind of universal that they're, they're very weak in their cyber capabilities. But again, that could all change. And it's just a matter of, at least when you look at something like that, and, you know, the UK government making an investment to at least prepare themselves, I mean, that's a good thing, though, right? Even though it's going to be a little costly. Yeah, it's interesting how how much attention critical infrastructure and ISIS and all this is getting. Ted Koppel, he just released a book. Uh, I think it's called Lights Out. It's basically about attacks against, like, the energy grid and critical infrastructure and stuff like that. He's been making the rounds, doing interviews, and... So it's interesting that we've been talking about this really on the podcast over the past year. And now with the ISIS attacks and with this new book from Ted Koppel, it seems kind of it's really elevated to where a lot of people are talking about it. And some actions actually getting taken where people or governments are investing some, some money to, to try to combat it. Moving on, we have some uh, advisories for everyone. In case anyone's not aware, depending on what holiday you celebrate or what religious beliefs you have, the holiday shopping season is upon us. And in the cybersecurity world, that also typically means that this is where con the, the consumer goods sector really becomes the forefront of a lot of what we talk about. There are two new variants of point-of-sale malware that are being talked about uh, right before the holiday shopping season. The first one is called Cherry Picker, and the second one is called Abaddon POS. According to reports, uh, the Cherry Picker point-of-sale malware has actually been around since 2011. And the Abaddon POS, uh, it seems to be a new threat. I've never heard of it. And according to the reports I read, they didn't really give like a, uh, a date on like, you know, when it was created or anything like that. Something that's really important to point out, we also talk about EMV or chip and pin, whatever you want to call it. While, yes, there are stores out there that are implementing this new point of sales technology, and that will protect you for the most part from a lot of this point of sale malware. A lot of stores, as we've pointed out in previous podcasts, do not have this technology yet. So it's going to be really important that people watch out for this. And one thing that I noticed on the mornings before we record the podcast, I'm always diving into the data to see if there's anything new. And I was thinking it's kind of been a pretty slow news week. There really hasn't been a lot out there besides ISIS. But in our data, I actually found a couple of stories related to payment card breaches that I really didn't see getting much attention. The first one was there was point-of-sale malware that was discovered at Noble House Hotels and Resorts, and that affected six different properties over a period from December 2014 to August 2015. I believe that they're like a, a luxury hotel kind of uh, thing. 
kind of sounds like it, yeah. And then another one, Fashion to Figure, which is a plus-size women's company, which I never heard of before. They announced a data breach, which was due to malware on a third-party web hosting firm. Uh, that malware was installed in March, and I think they discovered it in like October or something. But the web server contained credit card information according to the notification letter, so they're notifying customers that their payment cards were stolen. And then a third story that kind of went under the radar this week is Swiss Cleaners, which is a family-owned and operated dry cleaning and laundry business. They discovered point-of-sale malware on their systems, affecting customers from December 2014 until October 2015. And it's just interesting, in, in all these cases, which is kind of typical for payment card breaches, but it was an outside party, it was uh, law enforcement, things like that, that notified them of the breach. So, of course, they had no idea what's going on. They're just serving up customer payment card information to everybody. I don't know if any of these are tied to this newly, newly announced point of sale malware because companies generally don't say what type of malware or whatever it was in their in their letters so i'm not sure exactly what that was but i thought it was kind of interesting that all those went under the radar this week yeah and another thing to point out is uh you know let's say during the holiday shopping season if there are any stores or point of sale systems out there that are affected we more than likely won't hear about it until after the holiday season so just be mindful of that uh, we have another advisory. Uh, this one is a government hacktivist warning. Following last month's hack of CIA Director John Brennan's personal email, the Internet Crime Complaint Center, or IC3, has issued an alert warning that law enforcement personnel and public officials may be at increased risk of cyber attacks. In addition to doxing, which is the act of gathering and publishing individuals' personal information without permission, Threat actors have been observed compromising the email accounts of officers and officials. In the last month, a group of hackers known as uh, Crackers, uh, cra <laughs> That's, I, I remember seeing this. Yeah, we uh, talked about it, I think, back when it happened. Yeah. In the last month, a group of hackers known as Crackers with Attitude, they bragged about breaking into John Brennan's email account, the email account of the FBI's deputy director's wife, and also claimed to have gained access to a law enforcement online portal where they found a database of thousands of law enforcement agents' personal details. Uh, the hackers said all these actions were done to support Palestine. Another story I saw that was kind of interesting is these police body cams that are being shipped with the Conficker worm. Police body cameras purchased from Martell Electronics are being preloaded with this Conficker worm. The infection was identified by the security firm iPower, after one of the cameras was attached to one of its computers and the PC's antivirus program was immediately triggered. The attack attempts to spread the infection throughout a company's network once the initial computer is affected. And there's actually a, a book on the Conficker worm. I believe it's just called Worm. I listened to the audiobook of it, but it's kind of like a little mystery of like you got all these researchers kind of tracking down and combating it and working with the government agencies. It's a pretty good insight into sort of all the bureaucratic mess and everyone trying to fight these cyber criminals. I, I found it totally fascinating. Yeah, I might have to check that out because the, the, this uh, this configure worm and everything that that's actually I mean when I was when I was reading into that and I saw that was 15 million Windows PCs have been affected. That that's quite a that's quite a big number. Well, this this worm was from a few years ago, but they were talking about in the book the the researchers were really concerned that it could basically crash the internet. If you want to know more about it, you should check out that book. It's pretty interesting. Our, our last advisor for the week uh, has to do with a mail advertising campaign that's affecting over a million people. Three casinos were used as decoys for a large mail advertising campaign. Using bogus advertisements such as free copyrighted movies and pirated software, yay, uh, users were lured uh, into the trap. I, I don't even know what to say sometimes when I, when I see this, Jeff. Anyone who clicked on one of the ads was redirected to one of three casino websites, and the three websites were pennyslot.net, playcasino77.com, and onlinecasinofun.org. The attackers used 30 different variants of malware to conduct their attack, including CryptoWall ransomware and the Bonitu Trojan. So watch out for that, guys. Anything that sounds too good to be true probably is. Just, just throwing it up. Yeah, so, so moving on to some of the legal developments, one of the bigger legal stories this week was a uh, court ruling in favor of LabMD over the FTC. This LabMD story goes back, I believe, all the way to like 2008, 2009. 
Um, it's kind of a crazy roller coaster story. It's been going on for years and all sorts of stuff to it, but just kind of a brief summary. Uh, the FTC opened an investigation in 2009 after there was reports that around 9,000 Lab MD customers had their names, social security numbers, dates of birth, and personal health insurance information exposed on publicly accessible peer to peer file sharing networks. So security firm Tiversa alerted LabMD to this so-called breach years back, but the lab, they thought the, the findings were basically just a way to coerce it into paying for the security services. Uh, so then Tiversa ended up reporting these findings to the FTC. Went on for years and years. Uh, Terry Robinson at SC Magazine, she wrote about it a couple days ago, and she said, quote, what ensued was not only an FTC investigation, but also court challenges, lawsuits, the eventual shuttering of LabMD, a tell-all book penned by LabMD CEO Michael Doherty, a congressional committee probe, whistleblower testimony, and much finger-pointing. So the story is really long and crazy, um, and it also involved, I think back in May, the, a Traversa employee testified that Traversa had fabricated some of the evidence that led to this FTC investigation. So all, all sorts of crazy stuff going on here, but I guess bringing it up to what happened this week was on Friday, November 13th, a judge ruled in favor of LabMD over the FTC. And and this is from the National Law Review. They said that while Judge Chappelle's decision represents a victory for LabMD as the first company to successfully challenge an FTC Section 5 data security enforcement proceeding, the ruling may prove short-lived as staff will likely appeal the case to the full commission which will review the decision. Nevertheless, the commission's eventual handling of this proceeding could articulate a more precise standard for likely substantial injury that could guide future Section 5 unfairness jurisprudence. So all that technical mumbo-jumbo basically is saying that this could be an important case. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> This is interesting because, and we've t we talked about this very recently with the, uh, concerning the FTC, and the FTC, it seems like they, they have this increasing power to kind of go after whoever they want, and, you know, they can, you know, they can levy fines and things like that. Um, from what I read about this case, though, yeah, LabMD, yeah, okay, they, sc they screwed up, but it really seems like the FTC, I don't know if it was like a personal vendetta or something, they really came after these guys. Yeah, that, I, that's kind of the impression that uh, a lot of the quotes and stuff from the, the LabMD people that I read. With all these legal things that we're talking about, it's really all about, I mean, when we had Thomas Roback on a couple of weeks ago, the lawyer, um, he was talking about the issue of standing. And there's all these aspects of these different laws, like whether you can prove future damages or whether there's what's, what's damages, or in this case, what Section 5, quote, unfairness means. So I think the big takeaway is that as these different lawsuits and things develop, you know, businesses should hopefully have a better understanding of what is expected of them, which is good in some cases. But then on the other hand, like we were talking a couple weeks ago, it also means that if there's these expectations and they're more clearly defined, then it's also easier to sue and easier to, you know, go through with these different, um, with different litigation because it's much easier to point to this and say, hey, this is what you're supposed to do and you didn't live up to it. Moving on with legal news, two women have filed a class action lawsuit against the state of Georgia. The lawsuit is due to a massive security breach that exposed the information of more than 6 million voters in the state. The complaint alleges that Georgia Secretary of State Brian Kemp released the information on the 6 million voters to the media, political parties, and other paying subscribers who legally buy voter information from the state. Might be hearing about that one in the future, Jeff. Another legal news, there was a British man who was jailed after some tweets. Ian Sullivan from Maryside, Britain. He was arrested after the National Crime Agency's Cybercrime Unit discovered his Twitter account making references to DDoS attacks. Sullivan was able to take down more than 300 websites with denial of service attacks. Some of the websites included British Airways, the Conservative Party, several multinational banks. But... Like with a lot of these hacktivists, you had to boast about it, had to brag about it, and they used Twitter, and they got him. And he has received an eight-month prison sentence for those crimes. Do you think of the world of cybersecurity, like all these hackers and everything, do you think they get, like, street cred, like, if they end up, like, going to prison for a certain amount of time? Well, I know they definitely get street cred from their attacks and stuff, uh... I don't know about going to prison because then it's like you got <laughs> caught. It's almost like you didn't you didn't do your job quite right. You just stay under the radar. 
Yeah, but, it's like when they go to they go to prison and like you know like how the bigger inmates they get the tattoos you know what they've done maybe they get like a like a hashtag or you yeah know, some, like, <laughs> some weird type of code or something you get that like, yeah. you get op ISIS tattooed on your arm you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right oh man. Uh, yeah, so that wraps up the top trending cyber events, advisories, and legal actions from the past week. Before we get to our interview with Mark Gazit, we have our funny story of the week. Do you find anything out there this week, Matt? Yeah, and I, I, this this story made me laugh and it made me a little angry. A man from Sydney, Australia, made headlines this week after the NSW, which stands for the New South Wales Police Force, illegally hacked the man's Facebook account. The man's name was Riz Liam Halvey. And he was arrested after the police were monitoring his uh, his Facebook account for four months. He was charged with three counts of using a carriage service to offend police and a further three counts of publishing an indecent article. The image in question here that really brought this about, it was a picture of Miley Cyrus photoshopped in front of an NSW police officer twerking. If you know who Miley Cyrus is, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Apparently, the police department didn't take kindly to that. The problem with all of this is that the surveillance of this man's account was illegal, and it was found illegal by a judge. One of the problems that we find in this case is that high-ranking police officers came out and actually supported the police department's you know, decision to monitor this guy's account because what they did was they were, they were checking out his account, the reasons really are still unclear, but it, it's kind of coming back to they didn't like what he was posting. Um, yeah, they sound like a bunch of babies. I mean, I don't, I don't know the whole story, but they, they don't like a picture of Miley Cyrus Photoshop, so they arrest the guy. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, it, it brings more questions to why were they monitoring his account, you know, and these are questions that were asked by uh, Magistrate Roger Brown. When this case went to court, all six charges were dismissed. City Magistrate Brown was appalled by the police force's actions calling them, quote, reprehensible and calling the charges trivial. Uh, not only was the court case dismissed, uh, Brown ordered costs to the police department of $14,429. The NSW Council Civil Liberties President Stephen Blanks uh, said of the incident, quote, how deep in police culture is this willingness to break the law? Even after they have been caught out, it would appear no adverse consequences are going to be suffered by those responsible because the illegal actions are supported by police at the most senior level, end quote. In the past, Halvey has also teased this police department. This was kind of funny. Um, he was posting pictures up there. He, it was a police officer from the department, a stack of cash for like $25,000. And of course, he included Bradley Cyrus twerking in front of another police officer. He put the message, here's my $25,000 for your $101 fine. So... Great that the police got kind of got what was coming to them, but what were these guys thinking? Now coming up, we have our interview with Mark Gazit. He's the CEO of Israel-based Thetaray, and we chat about the diversified criminal conglomerate that's behind the attacks on financial institutions such as J.P. Morgan Chase, and what that means for the future of cybercrime. Last week, there was an indictment that was unsealed that charged several people with cyber crimes related to the reported hacks at J.P. Morgan Chase, E-Trade, Scott Trade, and Dow Jones. Um, the lead prosecutor in the scheme, he called it, quote, security fraud on cyber steroids. And he said also that it's no longer hacking merely for a quick payout, but hacking to support a diversified criminal conglomerate. So wondering if you could just give us maybe a little background on what you know in terms of what happened and what this criminal conglomerate is. So it was really happening, I think it's a great example of the new, I would say, frontier of crime. And that is that if before people were targeting specific bank or specific organization and trying to steal money the old way, actually what's happening here is organized crime covering different continents, different financial organizations and actually providing, in a way, a consolidation of data collected in one area or from one instance of crime to conduct totally a different uh, type of crime. We discussed this a year ago, and I think it's now happening. Hackers break into one organization to get data that they were not supposed to get. Then they break to a different organization 
to implant this data uh, to confuse markets. And then they break into end user devices, computers to actually conduct transactions, buy and sell transactions, sometimes fraudulent, sometimes it looks like real ones, to affect share prices. I was just reading up on the story today. I guess there's a whole lot about it that I didn't quite realize. I mean, for example, you have there's the, the largest theft of consumer data from a U.S. financial institution in history. But then uh, the perpetrator also owned and operated multinational payment processors. Uh, he also owned an illegal Bitcoin exchange. Uh, it said that he, that he colluded with corrupt international bank officials. Plus, I believe it said there was several hundred employees and other people colluding with him. So it seems like a pretty large operation, I guess. I mean, does that surprise you at all, just how big this whole thing is? Actually, it does not surprise me, and it doesn't surprise me because this is the way that allegedly uh, government organizations conduct their operations today to get information for their respective governments. They do very thorough, persistent work trying to break into hundreds of thousands of accounts. And of course, they're successful uh, breaking into hundreds of accounts, getting information, using those accounts to send infiltration emails to others. So it's, it's, a, it's a very well-planned, very thorough, and very precise work. And, you know, of course, I don't know the uh, micro details of this crime event. I uh, mainly uh, take information for what was published, but it's really the same type of work and the same procedures as governments will uh, do these days. Yeah, and one interesting thing I wanted to ask you about is, you know, as these, like, as, like the J.P. Morgan and these other uh, hacks came out over the past year, Every time the company would stress that, oh, there was no banking information that was taken, you know, they always just stress, oh, it was just emails and stuff like that. But then I was reading the BBC article about this just this morning, and in there uh, they wrote that hackers did not access bank details, but they didn't need to, nor did they even want them, because they made millions just using this personal information and in these pump and dump schemes. So, I mean, we've seen a lot of, I guess, stock market kind of stuff like that happen. Just wondering your thoughts on on that kind of whole topic. Yeah, so I agree with you. And, uh, you know, in the past, there was a feeling that if I can't steal your banking information, I could make uh, no harm to you, which uh, proves not to be true. I can sell your information to others. I can make use of the fact that it's possible. And when I say I, one can make, one can make uh, use of the fact that you can break into many machines simultaneously. Imagine hundreds of thousands of machines suddenly conduct cell commands. And of course, there are systems that might reject those commands later because the banking uh, accounts are uh, not right. But there will be a pending time when those requests will bombard the target systems. It's almost like denial of service attack, but not on the network level, but on the application level. One of the things that is very much commonly used is actually to to create chain attack uh, crime, which is basically to uh, break into... uh, computers of low-level banking employees, and then while uh, controlling their email to go up, how do you say it in English, to climb the ladder, the corporate ladder, until you get to uh, senior executives. And then it's enough for them to send an email, giving a buy or a sell signal that uh, would affect uh, the market. And when the executives would discover that there was a, a fraudulent email sent, it will be too late because uh, the markets will be moved. And when it's done in par with high-frequency trading using organizations like E-Trade, obviously the results are, uh, in this case, $100 million of uh, damage. How is it that these organizations that are spending so much money on cybersecurity, I mean, Chase Bank, I think, the recent news was that they were going to spend like a billion dollars over so many years. How is it that they're still getting hacked and then sometimes the criminals are in there for months or years? So I will give you my personal point of view here. And since we uh, already have a number of customers in this domain, if you think about it, for the last 100 years, they were studied and were trained to look for suspicious patterns. So if your salary is uh, $100,000 a year and you have a transaction of $1 million, it's a, it's a dangerous transaction. Uh, even if you uh, have like every day past ten thousand dollars, we can see accumulated amount. It would be a dangerous transaction. If you use your credit card in UK and one minute later you use it in the United States, it's a suspicious transaction. But what's really happening is all those financial institutions they go digital, what we call online banking. 
And suddenly, it is possible to use your credit card in UK, and one minute later in the United States, you just do online purchase in UK uh, site, and then you buy it from uh, US uh, eBay. And hackers obviously know that today uh, that doesn't uh, doesn't make any sense to try to move one million dollars because it will be cost. But for them, it's not a problem to break into one million bank accounts or end user computers and try to move one dollar from each one of them, and it's the same amount of money, but nobody pays attention. You know, the good news is that the technology is here, but it's very difficult for financial institutions to understand it, that what they learned for the last 100 years is not very applicable to the new world of internet, where anything is connected to anything. And that's why they spend billions of dollars on building the detection and the, the defense system of the past, which, by the way, are very important. But it's almost like... You know, I have my castle and they invest huge amounts of money in building just huge walls around my castle and then strengthening the gates and suddenly there are airplanes bombing uh, my castle. And the fact that I invested a lot in building those huge walls uh, not necessarily makes it effective anymore. Yeah, it helps against, you know, ground forces, but there are other alternatives. And I think the same is happening with banks. They invest huge amounts of money in building those firewalls and putting the best antivirus solutions, but guess what? Firewalls can only help if the attack is coming from outside the organization. But today, outside the organization doesn't exist. On one hand, your organization employees come with a mobile phone, which is bring your own device. So they are inside the organization by definition. And on the other hand, the organization itself is in the cloud, so the borders disappear, and antivirus solutions are not very effective against zero-day attacks because zero day by definition is a virus or a malware or an attack or an exploit that nobody knew before, so we're dealing with a known unknown. And I think that slowly but surely organizations understand that they should not throw away the uh, protection systems of the past. That if would like to be ready for the future, they need to use a different type of solution. And the same way that email and Facebook change the world of communication, and Google changed the world of access to information, I believe that uh, new computer-based solutions will change the world of security and organization. Um, I guess this this particular case really strikes me is that just how big it is and how many different aspects, and, you know, we've talked a lot about the cybercrime and his business model, and this one really seems like a truly cybercriminal enterprise, so... Just is that kind of what you expect going forward? We're going to see more of these big conglomerates that are kind of cyber criminals in five, ten different things at once? I think that we'll see more of this style of attacks, but it will not stop there. It will move not only towards the cyber crime attempt to steal money, but it will be extended to unfortunate events of money laundering and federal financing. It's not a secret today when we look at the, the recent tragic events in France that one of the reasons why ICD, ICD is successful is ability to finance it using by individuals by different countries in the European Union and the United States. This type of money laundering attempts will more and more, more use the means of cyber. Communication will become more discreet. Uh, allegedly, they were using PS4 boxes to communicate between each other and the kind of terrorists. So what I think will happen is not only we will see more of this type of crime, and we did discuss this one year ago, becoming a reality, but that the use of funds, the use of proceeds, as a result of this crime, will become uh, more uh, severe. It will finance terror, it will finance drug trafficking, it will finance other uh, activities. I think the good side of it is that it will make government organizations, large organizations, uh, law enforcement agencies, much more aware, and they will invest more in technology, more in understanding the events, more in uh, automatic anomaly detection systems, and other means of crime-fighting uh, technologies. And as I always say, eventually, this movie is a happy end movie, because the bad guys becoming uh, tougher, but I think the good guys becoming tougher as well. So it shows that good guys eventually win. And that'll do it for this week's episode of the Cybercrime and Business Podcast. Big thanks to Mark Gazit for stopping by. Just a quick note that next week we will be off, so you won't get the usual podcast filled with cybercrime news. 
Instead, we have a special episode on vulnerability management that we're putting together, and that will be coming out next Friday. The Cybercrime Business Podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact to their business, and practically address threats head on. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find us and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and all the major podcasting sites. And for more information on strategic cyber threat intelligence, check out surfwatchlabs.com.